looking at an old walnut tree, which some people feel is the site of the original Monticello, which is a very important town that we've talked about a little bit in this video. We're here in downtown Longview, Washington, at the site where the Monticello Convention has been uh, commemorated. Hey, how are you? Welcome to the Cowlitz County Historical Museum. This is a, an axe head made by Hudson's Bay Company a blacksmith. In fact, if you look closely here, you can see the initials AR have been stamped in them, and that would be the, the blacksmith who actually made it. We're going to do something a little bit different right now and actually take a trip on the river, just like the pioneers would have done 150 years ago. Hi, folks. I'm Bud May. I'm kind of the unofficial historian of Castle Rock. The official ones died long ago. Uh, folks, this is the rock for which Castle Rock was named. Hi, I'm really glad you're out here today to take a look at these good um, memories we have of early day steamboats on the Cowlitz River. Here we are on the north bank of the Cowlitz River. Earlier we were shown this tree, which uh, you'll see in a minute. It's a huge cedar tree, which can be seen from the river. <laughs> Okay, we're here today on the banks of the Cowlitz River with Michael Hubbs. Michael, nice to see you again. Nice to meet you. You're going to tell us a little bit about your family's history with this area, and you're a descendant of Simon Plamondon. And Chief Skaniwa. And Chief Skaniwa. Well, tell us a little bit about the importance of this area. This area is an old village site. Well, actually, I should say the village site just slightly upriver. But this was a family plot that was my great-great-grandfather is the son of Simon Jr. and he migrated here and set up shop for a ferry crossing. We all had to make money in our days. Yep. So the, the remnants of it, there's an old shack up there which you can see and there, this date ferry crossing has to date back 1860s, 1870s. He would have been a young man then uh, this actually was an island at one time. Out in the middle of the river, when they had the ferry crossing here, obviously it was replaced over the years as it got old and decrepit, but the old remnant of the last ferry is sunk out in the middle of the river here. Uh, but the stanchion posts and the guy wires and all that are still sitting over here where you see the shack on the opposite side of the river. And there's also another house sitting in the trees there by the large maple there that's turning color right now. And there used to be a third house that sat over by the tallest fir tree over here. And the grandmother and her sisters used to come down uh, to the mouth of the Oloquah Creek, which is just to the right of the tall fir, and come down and get their fresh water every morning for the house. It's it's an anywhere I go on this river, it's it's just like home. There's just a piece of family on the way here today I, I you know it's all kinds of things you know just reminds me of home and family and you know it's you know, it's hard to visit each and every one of them because I'd spend all day visiting yeah <laughs> <laughs> well can we walk up a little bit further and take a look at the mouth of the creek because we can't see it too well from here yeah that's fine so this is the mouth of the of Oloquah Creek over here yeah this is the mouth of Oloquah Creek uh, as I said, there used to the old house, the original house, used to stand right where the tall fir is, and the family used to come down and get the fresh water out of Oloquah Creek, uh, long before there was indoor plumbing. <laughs> uh, we walked the the whole area here last year, and we're kind of sad to find I, I I took uh, my grandmother's sister down here and. She was saddened because we walked the whole area up there and she couldn't find a single remnant, not an old bush, a flower, nothing of where the old house stood. Mm -hmm. Mother Nature has completely yeah. taken it back. And she knew where she was when she would stand there that this is where she grew up, but she was saddened because she couldn't recognize it. Right. There was nothing well, left. Well, speaking of remnants, you're going to take us and show us an old cabin that belonged to your family. Can we go up and see that now? Dan Plamondon's father built the log cabin we're going to go see and it's just up the road a little bit and he got that as a second donation claim 
because his first one was stole from him. Ah. <laughs> so we'll go visit that site next. Okay, great. Well, here we are at the site of the Plamondon cabin, and Michael, you had told us a little bit about this earlier. It's a pretty interesting and early cabin. Can you give us some of the background here? Well, the cabin belonged to my third great-grandfather. He built it here in the 1860s, between 1860 and 1870. We know this because his first child was born in Toledo at the old Callis Landing, and his second child was born here in 1870 at this site. So somewhere between that 10-year span, he moved to this site and built the cabin. He was in conjunction with his father when he built it because they were both Hudson Bay, or Junior was the son of a Hudson Bay man. And we're talking here about Simon Plamondon being your, that would be your fourth great-grandfather? My fourth great-grandfather, Simon Plamondon. There was nobody, Simon's history is, he was the first here, the first to make contact with, with my other side of my family, the Cowlitz. Mm -hmm. and. He started this state. I, I guess you would say I descend from the first families of this state. And this is his son's house. They had a little falling out, but I'm sure that they got together to build this house for him. Okay. Uh, and Simon's first wife was a member of the Cowlitz tribe. Simon's first wife was Veronica. It was her Christian name. And Thasimeth was her birth name. Uh -huh. She died in childbirth around 1834, 35 with uh, their fourth child. And Simon stayed on the prairie over by the mission site his whole life and his son, you know, his children migrated outward. And uh, this is a result of Junior's moving away from his dad to kind of isolate himself a little bit. He wanted to get off the prairie. He'd had a bad thing with one of the other settlers during the Indian Wars and he wanted to get out of the area of Toledo. So he came over here and the whole family has basically been born here. Uh, my grandmother was born here. In this uh, cabin. In this cabin. Uh, clear back, I'm told by my grandmother before she died that her mother was born here. Uh, the only thing I can figure out is that Simon Jr.'s wife may have been a midwife or one of the family may have been a midwife, but all the, the elders were born here. And Junior didn't get rid of, he's half Indian. And he didn't get rid of all his Indian ways. He, he tried to be French Canadian, but the fact that the house faces east shows that his Indian beliefs, and where you always rise to the, you know, the rising sun. So. Oh, okay. Now you had told us earlier some of the um, uniqueness about this cabin construction, and maybe if we walk over here to this other corner, we can see it. When they had the, when they were building the cabin, they they had all these logs cut and they laid them all out on the ground. And to do so that they didn't mix everything all up, they marked them. If you can see here with your camera, you can see marks. There's four notches in this log, three notches in this one, two in this one, and right on down all the way around the cabin. Each each log is that way. So, and then when they laid them together, they notched Hudson Bay style. For the outside but it, what's unique about it is they took the time before they they did all these logs and they adds the whole inside a smooth face it's it's like almost like a, a sheetrock wall if you'd say it's very smooth it's post and pinned this log here has fallen off the, the cabin's in sad shape because uh, it is what 150 years old yeah. And I'm surprised it's lasted this long. He, he built it the last. So. Well, and they're huge logs. Um, later on, we're going to go and visit the Jackson Courthouse, which is about the same time period, but that's made of much, much smaller logs. Right. And these are were huge trees. These are cedar. And they're, they're, I, I love the idea that, you know, when my grandmother told me that she was born in a log cabin with dirt floors, you know, I kind of scoffed at that. And mm -hmm. you know, nobody, you know, my generation, doesn't know anybody who was born on dirt floors. Right. <laughs> and she, she just had to rub it in and she we got in the car and she says, I'll prove it to you. And she brought me to the site and you know, ever since then I've just been in love with it. So yeah. Yeah. It's, it's just, it ties in the whole family and you know, to the old stories that she told me of, of her great-great-grandfather 
in his tales and, and you know being the first white contact in this country and it's it's I don't know if it's it's not bragging but it's it's just a good feeling to know you descend from the there's nobody here before your family. You're, yeah. you're the first. Yeah, yeah. Well, so. that's just being proud of your past. So. Um, and to think that Simon Plamondon, who was born in what, 1802? 1800. 1800. Yeah, I've got uh, at home. I have, uh, I guess you would call them baptismal records in 1800 for Simon Senior, and uh, so that would his brother was born. I do have a birth record for his older brother just two years before that, so that pretty much dates his, his 1800. Mm -hmm. And he, some people say that he died to 100 years old. Uh, and the headstone in the cemetery is a little off. Uh, I talked with another descendant of his uh, who has recently died, Francis Borty, and it was relayed to me that he, a friend of his, August Bonin, who was at buried also at the cemetery was a pallbearer for Simon Plamonda. Hmm. So it's first hand account or second hand account that I know that he only he died in 1881. So I did some more research and I found a document called Robin's Rolls and it, it his own son verified it is September 1881. So he didn't live to be 100 years Not old quite. like like everybody wanted him to be <laughs> and he didn't have 12 wives like everybody had. He only had about 7. So Well, that's enough. That's enough. <laughs> but to think that someone who was born over 200 years ago had his hands on these logs and helped to shape these logs. That's, I know, that's it, a pretty neat thing to be it, proud it of. Feels, it feels good to touch it, to know that you know, the family's still here on the prairie and we haven't gone anywhere and we're not going anywhere. Uh, I guess you can classify me as, as Calitz Mati. It's, it's Calitz Indian and Mati, for those who don't know what Mati is, it just simply means mixed blood. Mm -hmm. And uh, usually French Canadian, right? French Canadian, yes, and that's what he was, and uh, his family is throughout this whole area. Uh, I'm telling you, from Canada to the Willamette Valley, we've got descendants all on the west of the Cascades. There's thousands of us. Well, thanks, Michael, for showing us because this is really a unique remnant of the trail days, and uh, I hope you managed to conserve this. And well, I I was I was kind of happy to show you. But I wanted to also impress that Simon wouldn't have had the opportunity to do this if his father-in-law hadn't given him permission to marry his daughter. Right. Or none of this would have ever happened. And that was the chief That Skinny was Skinniwa. And he he was a powerful man in his day. He there was he would I'd say comparing today's leaders, he had more power than the president has today. He because I don't know if the president today has power over life and death. This guy, Skinniwa, could just simply say, I want him gone, and you're, you're gone. It's that simple. And he, he was known through Hudson Bay Records as Chief of Chiefs, and there was nobody that came through this whole Puget Sound area that didn't go through him. Nobody. Right. And when you went from the Willamette Valley to the Canadian border today, that was his t territory. He ruled all this at one time. He was immense power and Hudson Bay knew that and they knew that if they could get Simon to marry into the Skaniwa's family they'd have it sealed in here for Hudson Bay for for who knows how long and you know until they went out of business mm -hmm. so yeah. but uh, yeah quite the history well thanks for showing us around and then you. we'll hope to see you again sometime we hope to see this thing brought back up to shape we're gonna try okay yeah. thanks Michael thank you hey, Karen we're here on the banks of the Cowlitz River, about three miles above Toledo, Cowlitz Landing Area, and I understand this is known as Mission Bar. Can you tell us more about this? Well, see, now you just told me something I didn't know. Um, but this was the place where, when the Hudson's Bay Company established Cowlitz Farms, which we'll go up and see in a minute, this was the place on the river where uh, the canoes and bateaus would come and land, and then the fur traders and, uh, and other people who were visiting the Hudson's Bay Post would stop here and have to go uh, by foot or by horse up the uh, up the hill to the Cowlitz Farms, which was what maybe about a mile away from here. About a mile away. And there are various as through the eons, as the Cowlitz River carved out this floodplain, there are banks or steps, um, and you can see that as we go up the hill, uh, these different levels. And so that was here when the uh, fur traders were here with Hudson's Bay Company, and. 
So in the old days we had canoes and bateaus and strictly uh, people-powered vessels. And now you can see we've got some other uh, little fancier boats around here. So this is a pretty popular fishing spot today. But we're going to go ahead and drive up this road now to where the old Cowlitz Farms was and we're going to look at the Mission Cemetery. So let's go on, go on up there now. Behind me here, you can see over those new houses, um, way down to the river. And that's where we just were, where the landing place was for the Hudson's Bay canoes and bateaus. And if you can imagine 150 years ago, 180 years ago, uh, fur traders and suppliers coming up, up these benches of land to where we're standing now, which was the many thousand acres of land that the Hudson's Bay Company owned and operated as Cowlitz Farms. We're at St. Xavier's Cemetery, and right here you can see a stone that is for Simon Plamondon. And as was mentioned earlier by Michael Hubb, uh, they think that the dates are not correct, that he wasn't, uh, that he didn't actually live between those two years, but we'll have to do some more research on that one. But we do know that he actually is not buried here, but the stone is here just because many of the other Plamondons and French Canadians are buried in this spot. There are some wonderful gravestones in this cemetery, and uh, I suppose another famous person that uh, lived in this area and died and was buried here is Marcel Bernier, or Bernier. Um, he was actually born over in Spokane and moved here early on. He was a Hudson's Bay employee and was an important pioneer in the area. And there are a lot of his descendants buried here. And uh, truly to come out to this cemetery and walk around and look at some of these fantastically beautiful and very informative headstones is a neat thing to do. Good evening, folks. My name is Augustus Chatham. And I've been asked by some of the folks here in town to come and, and meet with you and, and tell you a little bit about the trail and what the trip is going to be like. Basically, the, the, the train captain is the boss. And one of the things, if you choose to join us on the trip, you have to recognize that um, I'm going to be the boss and, and Tom Galt's going to be the assistant. Now, you're free to leave anytime you want. And that's not unusual for trains to, to break up and reform. But as long as you're part of our train, uh, you're going to look to me for, for the decisions and uh, all, all the uh, actions are wh where we go and, and when we go. So we just need to understand that from the start. Um, that, that's the way we're going to operate, and I, but I still hope you will join us. I will look at my notes here in my, in my book here once in a while just to make sure that I don't forget something for you. Let's talk a little bit about uh, the trip. Uh, I'm going to California. But I understand that a lot of you folks want to go up to the new territory of Washington, and that sounds fine. I've never been up there, but I hope I will get up there sometime. Some other people in the train are going to Oregon, so th that's not unusual. When we start out here, uh, here in Council Bluff, we always have lots of people going different places, and we really don't know in some ways the exact route that we're going to be covering. So we'll make that decision as we go along, and maybe even some folks will change their mind to whether they're going to California, to Oregon, or to that new territory of Washington. The way we'll go, basically, is from Council Bluff. Uh, we'll go down to the southwest till we get to the Platte River. We'll follow the Platte clear to the Rocky Mountains. Uh, at near South Pass, we'll get on the Sweetwater River. We'll probably take Sublette's cutoff over to Fort Hall and then over to the Snake River country. At that point, folks going to California will split off right at the Raft River there. You go off to the southwest on the California Trail. The old Oregon Trail continues along the Snake River, across the Blue Mountains, and over to the Columbia. At that point, when you get to the Dalles, you'll have a choice of whether you go down the river uh, on, a, on a raft, or you could take Mr. Barlow's toll road around the southern side of Mount Hood into Oregon City. Then from Oregon City and Fort Vancouver area, you go down the Columbia a little bit to the mouth of the Cowlitz, 
up the Cowlitz to Cowlitz Landing and then overland on a pretty rough and rugged road going on to Tumwater. And that'll put you on the south end of the Puget Sound. Now, Captain? Yes, Captain. sir. Thomas, Thomas Wills. Thomas J. Wills stands for Jefferson. Now, how's come we're not traveling on the Sabbath? Now, I'm not a religious man, sir, and I hate to lose time. This is a big argument uh, about whether we do that. Uh, my own personal feelings are that we're better off taking a day off. Uh, people get pretty worn out. Uh, we're going to be traveling about 15 miles a day, day after day. And it's better to take that day off and rest the people and, and rest the animals and, and do some repair. And I think you get there just about the same time if you do that and only travel six days or if you uh, travel the full seven days in a row. Uh, we're not going to do it, uh, you know, we'll, we'll be flexible and if there's time we need to make up, well, we're going to keep going. But basically we'll plan to take a, a day off on the Sabbath. Let's talk a little bit about dangers. Everybody's uh, got a lot of fears of making this trip and some of them are, are real and, and some of them aren't. Uh, the one, one that most people think about are Indian troubles and that one is really uh, greatly exaggerated. Uh, Ten years ago, the Indians were probably more of a help than they were a, a hindrance to the, to the people traveling. It's gotten a little more difficult now. Uh, people are starting to settle in the Indian lands and this is making the, the Indians a little bit nervous about what things are going on. So it, it can be a problem and we're going to be careful. And, and one of the things by staying together and having a, a well-organized wagon train you can, uh, you can make uh, ourselves unattractive to the, to the Indians. The other uh, problem is disease. And our biggest problem, uh, everybody's problem, has been cholera. Had some really bad years a couple of years ago when the large groups were going to California. Things are a little bit uh, better right now. Um, cholera, we don't know what the, how to avoid it. There's a couple of things we can do, though, that uh, other people are recommended. One is boiling water. Um, boiling water seems to help. Some people even run it through the charcoal of their fire to make the water pure. The other thing we want to do is stay out of the river bottoms and away from the swamps. Um, there's putrid air in those areas that we want to stay away from. So we think maybe that can, can help out. Now, Captain, Tom, Thomas Wills again. Now, it's all well and good to talk about on the trail, but what about the climate in California? I've heard it's a salubrious climate, and I want to know if all them stories are true. Now, I heard that, that one, one, one fellow there lived so long that he wanted to die, and they had to take him out of California so he could die. And then when they took him back to, to bury him, he came back to life again. Now, now Captain, that, that might be far-fetched, but <clears throat> is that true, Captain? What, do you, what, what can you tell me? I remember some old stories from Oregon that were about the same. The early days of Oregon, they were telling us what, uh, what a paradise Oregon was, and there were some, some great stories about uh, things that could be grown in the Willamette Valley. As I say, I've been to California, and, it's, and I'm heading right now for Shasta County, probably in the gold fields, and it's a, it's a good climate. Um, I don't know that people live any longer there than any place else, but the, the summers are nice and warm. The weathers are fairly dry. I've lived on the Missouri River in Quincy, uh, where we have the fevers along the river, and we won't have that in California. It's sunny and nice, so I'm, I'm going to California. That's reassuring, sir. Thank you. In addition to disease, the uh, major cause of accidents or cause of death on the trail are accidents, and that takes uh, two, two forms, basically. One is being run over by a wagon. These wheels right here aren't too friendly if you get caught underneath one of them. And unfortunately, it's the kids that tend to have the biggest problem with getting run over by a, a wagon wheel. The other problem is firearms. I know that most of you folks are farmers, and you're not really uh, experts with your firearms, so I just have to warn you to be careful uh, when you're out there. Don't have your gun loaded. Be careful the way you handle it. If we get into areas with Indians where we need to have our firearms out, we can get organized at that time, but those are the two things that cause uh, more problems on the trail uh, are the firearms and, and the wagons. Drownings are a problem. We've got a big river in front of us right now as we sit here in Council Bluffs. We have to, we have to cross the Missouri River 
uh, as soon as we're ready to go. And uh, we'll be using the ferries. The Mormons are here and run the ferries there. I recommend you use that. It costs a few dollars, but it's well worth it to get across this, this big old uh, river. As we, when we, as we leave on this trip, uh, when the conditions are right, we'll be in springtime with rain and storms and really difficult conditions here on the first part of the plains. As we get further west, we'll enter into the great uh, desert area where it'll be very dry and water will be short. All of these things uh, are a threat to each one of us if we're, if we're not uh, taking care of ourselves and doing the uh, protection. I see looking around the room that some of you ladies are, are with child at this point and I, I suspect there are a lot more than what I'm seeing right now. Uh, so there's going to be a lot of babies born on the trail. I hope that you have made arrangements with your kinfolk to, to help you with that. Uh, we won't be stopping for more than a day when, when children are born, so we have to be ready to move on. Let's look at the equipment now. There's lots of equipment that we have to go. Uh, I looked at your wagons this afternoon, and most of you are taking farm wagons. That's fine. They need to be in good shape. Uh, this is a hard journey, journey and uh, unless your equipment is in good shape, it's not going to make it. Most important is the, the wheels of the wagon, and make sure you have good tires and good spokes and that they're in good condition. Uh, I hope that some of you are blacksmiths so that as we go along that we'll be able to, to uh, make repairs. That will be important because things will wear out and, and break as we go along. The, as far as animals, uh, if you have enough money, which I don't, the best thing to use are mules. Uh, a, couple of, a couple of mules are, will kind of cope with the plains. They uh, can deal with lack of water and the, and the brush that grows out there, but they're fairly expensive. The most practical solution are oxen, and I see that most of you are using oxen right now. We need at least two yoke oxen and maybe uh, even three. When we get into the hill country, we'll be double teaming, tri triple teaming, and uh, joining together to get up some of the hills. So at least two yoke oxen, it would be good. Uh, if you're thinking about horses, you have to remember that you have to bring feed for the horses. The grass on the plains is, will not uh, be adequate for the horses, and they're a little less tolerant of lack of water when we get out into the Rocky Mountain area and on. So the oxen are really best. I hope you bring along a dairy cow. You can tether that to the back of the wagon and have fresh milk whenever you need it. If you take the milk and put it in a churn at the start of the day at the back of the wagon, you'll have fresh butter by, by, by evening time in each case. Uh, our diet basically is going to be bread and bacon and beans and rice and coffee, and that's about it. Bring along dried fruit to keep the scurvy away. Uh, dried fruit of all, of all kinds. Uh, pots and pans, a few, but not too many. The clothing, simple clothing is best. Uh, as I mentioned before, we're going to be in the plain. We're going to be in the springtime with the rains and storms and cold. Later on, we'll be in the heat and dryness in summer. So you need clothes that can adapt from one to the one to the another. Wearing multiple layers works better than having things that are uh, dedicated to early climate and, and the later storms. So that's about all I have. I, we can do some questions here. Uh, we're going to be ready to leave when the grass is up and the rivers are down. And we've got a, probably a couple of weeks to go before that happens. Um, I hope that you'll consider we welcome you to join us and to join our train. And if you don't choose to do that, well, I wish you good luck and uh, we'll see you out west someday. <laughs>
Oh, yes. A neighbor's teaching me. Well, we just came up the, the trail from the river, and we heard that the Jackson house was a good place to spend the night. Oh, yes. Pa always lets travelers stay here. Some soldiers from Silicon were here last week. There are people here almost every night. Is your Pa here? I'd like to speak to him. No, Mr. Mc... He and Mr. McFadden went up to Callet's Landing today, and he... And he'll be back tonight, but my brothers can show you where you can put your wagon and we got feed and water for your horses, too. Do you have any children? No, it's just my wife and I, and we're heading up to Puget Sound. Have you got time to play me a little tune on your fiddle there? I had a fiddle, but I lost it crossing the river on the trail coming west. So here we are at Lewis and Clark State Park, south of Chehalis, and this is a typical environment that the pioneers and all of the people who used the Cowlitz Trail would have had to travel through, aside from the prairies, because there really were those two environments. The open prairies with grass and camas flowers, and then these huge old growth trees. And this really, what you're seeing here today, is really just a vestige of what it looked like in the old days. Um, in 1962, there was a huge windstorm known as the Columbus Day Storm, which knocked out a lot of these trees. So if you can imagine this being even denser than it is now. Um, this is one of the, a very, this is a very special place because it's one of the last remnants of old growth lowland forest. Um, there are some old growth stands left higher elevations, but here um, this is a, a really good place to see old growth as it looked like and how the Cowlitz Trail travelers would have seen it. So I think if we walk down the trail a little ways, we can see a really prime example of a huge tree. Okay, okay, let's go. So here we are before a beautiful old growth Douglas fir tree, which is one of the main trees in this type of lowland forest, along with hemlock and cedar. Um, this tree, no doubt, is a lot older than the Cowlitz Trail, so it was here for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, Roger, you were going to tell us a story about traveling through these trees. Well, there is a story, and it's from a, a, a reliable source that just north of Vancouver, uh, as the travelers were coming up the Cowlitz Trail, some of them went into an area like this, probably a little more dense, and took their uh, team and, uh, and wagon in. And when they got to the point where they wanted to stop, they decided, they figured that they weren't able to turn around. So they actually had to dismantle their wagon and take it out piece by piece so that they could turn the horses around in the area. So you can imagine how thick this must have been and what an arduous trip it would be. Chuck, where are we off to next? Okay, now we're going to go down and take a look at some ruts that are nearby. that are not part of the actual Callus Trail, but they are very reminiscent of what was left from the days of the immigrant travel and Hudson Bay Company. So let's go down and take a look at those ruts now. Okay. These are wagon ruts, very reminiscent of what you find on the old immigrant roads. You can see the parallel deep whales caused by the wagon wheels. Through this area, this part of the trail is a connecting route from the west to the east and it connects to the Callis Trail. And we know this because of the early government land office maps show this as a route. And you'll see the the depth of the swales in other areas, especially in the desert areas, some of these swales can be four, five, six feet deep from the many wagons that travel that. And you'll also notice that there's not a lot of growth in the swales themselves, and that's due to the wheels compacting the soil, making it more difficult for vegetation to take over. How come the growth is uh, much more in the center? Well, this is interesting, and in, in the desert country we see this even more where the wagons have traveled, the oxen or horses or mules pulling the wagons 
left their deposits on the trail and it caused the soil to be fertilized and vegetation really took over in a narrow confined path compared to what was around it and you'll see some of that here now chuck one of the things that we discussed before was is this really really a wagon rut versus just a tree that had fallen down years ago, rotted, left a hump in the middle, and a swale off to either side. But you're saying that because there is the lack of vegetation on each side, that that's a good indication that soil's been compacted and, and uh, by wagon wheels. Right, and you look at an overall area, and there's a continuity between this part of the trail and other areas. Uh, it is a long, longitudinal section, and you won't find trees leaving that much of an impact on the on the trail. The parallel swales are here. It's just a really good indication of what the Callis Trail looked like during the mid to late 1800s. Okay, you sold me. Where are we off to next? Well, now we're going to go up to John Jackson's house. Uh, he was an early settler in the area, and he, his house became a courthouse, became the Highland Post Office, and he and his wife Matilda greeted many, many immigrants on their way north to Puget Sound. So we'll go up there and take a look at where they resided. Okay. okay. Here we are at the Jackson House. It's a historic site, now a state park. John Jackson and his wife Matilda lived here. Should we go inside? We're going to go inside and take a look at the inside of the Jackson House. One of the reasons we know so much about the Jackson Courthouse is because there were good records kept and stories written down and also the Jackson family themselves kept diaries. Um, John R. Jackson kept quite a few diaries which are still in existence and another really nice one that's in existence, this is a photo of it, was kept by Louisa Jackson who was the daughter of John and Matilda and she kept this diary in 1865 when she was 11 years old and there's a lot of really good information in here about the daily goings on of the farm called Highlands and her family. I'd like to show you a picture of the Jackson Courthouse. You'll see here it was taken in 1869 and John R. Jackson is on a horse in front of the courthouse which, if, which is standing right behind me. Let's go on in. Well, here we are in the interior of the Jackson Courthouse, which was built in 1850 or 51, thereabouts. The date is a little bit uncertain, but was used as the first courthouse. And this is still furnished with some of the original artifacts from John and Matilda. Um, in fact, here you can see their portraits on the wall. John and Matilda. Most of the portraits of John show him with two good eyes, but in reality he had only one eye. When he was a child, he lost his right eye in an accident when he fell off of a horse, and I think his eye was stabbed by some branches. Um, so his portraits are cleaned up a little bit. Some other original Jackson family artifacts are the chairs uh, that they owned. This was a braided rug on the floor here that was made by Matilda herself. Um, the sewing machine here was one of the first sewing machines in the territory, and Matilda herself sewed on this. And what else do we have here? Behind you we see Matilda's spinning wheel and some other artifacts and implements up on the mantle of the brick fireplace. And then we also have, really need to show you, the upstairs of the cabin, which was used to um, let settlers sleep in when they traveled here and camped here overnight. It's a very narrow stairway. This was a stop that almost anyone who was going up into the Puget Sound area or even north of here would stop. It was a, it was paced pretty well from the landing so you could you could get here and then from here uh, they would go on to wherever their destination was. But who are some of the other people? Well, almost all the important settlers in the area like Sidney Ford and McFadden and uh, Michael T. Simmons would have stayed here at one time or the other. 
um, as a settler coming through and also as a visitor, a frequent visitor to the home, and also some of the military men who uh, got their start here in the Northwest and went on to fame in other areas, like Ulysses S. Grant, who was here as a lieutenant in the early 1850s, and also Phil Sheridan, and a lot of those people who went on to fame in the Civil War, which was a few years after their time here in the Northwest. One of the things that impressed me, too, was the fact that Matilda Jackson was a tremendously renowned, I'll say cook. Yeah. <laughs> uh, she provided some very wonderful meals to the settlers and others coming through. And uh, her history is remembered in a state park just across the state highway here from us. And from here, the Cowles Trail was right out in front and it continued on north to Puget Sound. And now we're going to go up to what was called Saundersville, named after an early settler by the name of Saunders, now known as Chehalis. And from there, we'll go over to the original town site of Claquedo. Okay. So let's go up to Saundersville and see what we can find there. This old log house looks interesting. Can you tell us about who the owner was, the time period? This house was the home of Judge Obadiah McFadden, who was pretty famous in these parts back in the 1850s. Um, and he had this house built for him in 1859. He was sent here by James Buchanan in the early 1850s to be a judge for the Oregon Territory. And uh, Judge or James Buchanan was Secretary of State at the time and later became president. And when McFadden came out here, he ended up buying a piece of land from Schuyler Saunders, who was the founder of Chalice, and Saunders actually built him this log cabin. Um, there's not much original left of this cabin. The walls and the floor joist are still original, but the interior has all been remodeled. Uh, but again, it is an interesting example of log cabins of the time and is purported to be the oldest continually lived in residence in the county and maybe in the state. Um, so I think that's about it on McFadden, except we do have a photo of him. And this is uh, McFadden, uh, circa 1870, when he was a judge. By this time, he had moved up to Olympia and was a judge there. Um, and now I guess we're going to go on to the Lewis County Museum and see what they have. Yes, we are. Let's okay. go there now. Well, we're inside the Lewis County Museum in Chehalis now, and besides being part of this video on the history of the Cowlitz Trail, I'm also the newly hired curator of the museum, so I am wearing two hats today. But let me take you on a little tour of the museum and some of the things we've got today. A very special exhibit that we've got going on right now is a series of wood carvings that have been done by the Capital Wood Carvers Association of Olympia, and they have chosen to celebrate the bicentennial of the Lewis and Clark epic trip across the country by doing a series of wood carvings and, and also wood burned panels to illustrate some of the scenes. Let me tell you a little bit about um, this beaver pelt that's up on the wall. As we learned way down at Fort Vancouver, the Hudson's Bay Company was out here to gather beaver pelts and that was their main function and uh, everything was, uh, was done in terms of beaver pelts as currency. And what happened with those beaver pelts is that they were originally processed and made into beaver felt top hats. Because this was the fashion in the 17 and 1800s, this was the reason Hudson's Bay came out here to the Northwest, to get beaver skins to make these beautiful felt hats. And you can see how uh, the sheen and how fine these were. These were made from the under hairs of the beaver's coat. And that's why Hudson's Bay was here. Now let me take you into our Indian room where we have a lot of special things about the Indians of this area. One of the very special things we have in our Native American room is this diorama of what a Chehalis Indian village would have looked like pre-contact, before the white man came. And um, if we slowly look across this um, scene here, we see men splitting out cedar planks from the huge cedar trees. They would have used these cedar planks to make longhouses, which usually housed several families. And inside the longhouse, women would have been um, making blankets out of dog hair, because believe it or not, they actually had white dogs 
that they would comb the hair out of and use those for, uh, for wool to make blankets. They would also dry salmon over smoky fires. They'd made baskets. And people think of the Native Americans as being rather primitive, but they actually had uh, a highly evolved culture and they knew how to live in this environment and use all the flora and fauna of their environment to survive. Down on this end, we can see that it's obviously in the fall and the natives are catching salmon in the river. They also have the, their canoes out on the bank. They use different kinds of traps and nets in the river to catch the salmon as they were coming upstream. And up here on the wall, we actually have an authentic uh, fishing net that would have been a hand-held net. And you can see the uh, fake salmon swimming through it and getting caught. And then down this way, if we look past our big bear, we also have what was called a river canoe or a shovel nose canoe because they were very blunt on each end. Some of the canoes that you'll see have high prows with a figure, painted figure possibly on them. Those were more northerly canoes and also were used in the ocean. But here on the rivers that we had in southwest Washington, they normally used this uh, low shovel nose canoe. And also on the wall we have an authentic canoe paddle. And I think um, now we're going to go out to Cloquedo, which is a, a ghost town now, uh, although there are still some residences there. But it used to be a really thriving community back in the Cowlitz tra Trail days. So let's go out there now. Well, here we are at Cloquedo. Cloquedo was a little town that was developed by the Davis family in the late 1840s, early 1850s. Um, not much here today except residences, but in its day there were hotels, blacksmith shops, liveries, stagecoaches came through here, all the pioneers came through here, even though it was, strictly speaking, off the Cowlitz Trail. Um, here's a map of Cloquedo as it used to look in the old days. And by the way, Cloquedo is an Indian word meaning high ground or hill. And one of the reasons it was settled is it was because it was out of the swampy area in the low valleys. Um, we're standing right about here and where the church is and we'll talk about that more in a minute and later on we're going to go up here into this the Cloquedo Cemetery and look at the Pioneer Fir and we'll explain the significance of that and also we have the Cloquedo to Centerville Road and Chuck can you tell us just a bit about that road? Yes, the uh, Cloquedo Centerville Road was the military road or also known as the territorial road came from Monticello, Longview area north along what is now the Cloquedo Centerville Road and then on into the Centerville area itself. Centerville is now called Centralia and it, there's an interesting history be, behind the naming of that. They wanted to call it Centerville, they wanted to call it Hub City because this area was going to be the center of all the activity between Puget Sound and the Columbia River. They had to not use Centerville because there was already a Centerville in Washington Territory and so the post office wouldn't let them use that word so they called it Centralia. But yes, we will go up to the area and we'll see where the military road went. Okay. And there's still a part of the, of the trail up above there? The Cowlitz Trail joined the military road about three miles up the road at the south, uh, on, the, on the north side of the Chehalis River. And we'll actually be seeing that. We'll be seeing that shortly okay. when we visit the Borst home. Okay. Well, let me show you uh, an old photo that we do have of the Cloquedo Church. This photo was taken about 1890 or 91. And uh, as we pan over to the church as it exists today, you can see that it was beautifully restored because at this time it was already about 40 or 50 years old. The church was built in 1858 and is now the oldest Protestant church still standing in its original spot in the state of Washington. So let's go on over and take a look. Let's take a peek inside the church because the door happens to be open. So let's go see. So as far as I know, this is uh, how the church looked. Originally, they, it has been well restored and they did a lot of research when they did the restoration. Um, 
very simple church, but that's how it was in those days. Well, now if we leave here for the moment and go across the street to the Clequato Cemetery, we can see the big pioneer fir tree that so many pioneers remembered in their diaries. Lewis Davis, who had this whole area, often allowed settlers to camp underneath this tree, some of the pioneers that came up this way. And as you can see, there's a plaque here dedicated in 1937, indicating that this is the Clacoito pioneer tree. And Chuck, where from here would the military road have gone? Okay, as we saw on the map at the Coquito Church, it proceeded in a northerly direction. And if you look out here across the east side of the cemetery at the tree line, the military road went along the tree line, down into the little draw, and up and down to the Chehalis River Valley. Can we walk over there and look at that, uh, the road? There's a few yes. traces of it left. Okay, we're standing here on what was the military road. It's been slightly improved since then, but you can see it goes, went through the trees here, continued north to the Centerville area. We'll be visiting that shortly. We'll also, after that, go to the Borst home, and we'll see where the military road crossed the Chehalis River. We'll see the dugways that were left from the time that the, the ferries carried traffic across the river. So from here we're going to go to Centerville.